Happy Pride Month, everyone. I know that some of my viewers may find this topic controversial, but I hope that even if you do, you will stick around and watch this relatively short video. I promise that it will be a lighthearted, respectful look at culture and video games, and what you learn, I think, may surprise you. So let's get right to it. I'm going to start the video with a statement that many of you viewers will find shocking, and that is this. In East Asia, generally speaking, being transgender is seen as less controversial than being gay. In the entire continent of Asia, where 60% of the world's population lives, the only state that has legalized gay marriage is Taiwan, and gay marriage has only been legal there since 2019. As of June 2023, there are bills proposing gay marriage in India, Japan, and South Korea, but as of the date of this video's release, neither Japan nor South Korea recognize same-sex unions. Although China does to some extent. You may be surprised to hear that Japan doesn't even have nationwide protections against anti-gay discrimination. Some of the more progressive cities do, like Tokyo, but these protections exist at a local level and not at a federal level. However, in Japan and in South Korea and even in China, transgender people are legally allowed to change their gender after sex reassignment surgery as opposed to having gender changes banned outright. My beloved Taiwan has allowed transgender people to change legal gender since 2021 without any surgical requirements. Now, let's also be clear, more acceptance doesn't mean acceptable. Japan, in fact, requires those surgically transitioning to undergo mandatory sterilization, and there are still substantial stigmas in East Asia against transgender individuals. But at the very least, comparatively and culturally, there is more understanding and acceptance of trans people than one might expect from these traditionally-minded countries where even gay marriage has yet to be legalized. This may seem strange. Why are these developed countries so unwilling to budge when it comes to gay marriage, but relatively open by comparison to transgender people and, more relevantly, transgender portrayals in media? In the West, generally speaking, trans portrayals are still uncommon, while gay and lesbian portrayals are virtually mainstream. Why is East Asia so different in this regard? What puts trans acceptance ahead of gay acceptance there? And what does this have to do with video games? Well, to answer these questions, we're going to be looking at different portrayals of trans characters in Japanese games while discussing the cultural context of those characters. In so doing, it is my hope that we will develop a nuanced understanding of trans portrayals and trans acceptance in Japan and East Asia. But first, a word from our sponsor, Brilliant.org. As a working professional with a time-consuming YouTube side gig, my limited free time is more valuable than ever. I could spend that time playing Diablo 4, but why not learn something instead? That's where today's sponsor, Brilliant, comes in. Brilliant teaches you complicated topics like math, programming, data analysis, and engineering with only 15 minutes of interactive problem solving a day. Brilliant is built for busy people like myself, with its fun, bite-sized, low-pressure, and interactive lessons. Why not try Brilliant yourself by visiting brilliant.org slash moonchannel. My viewers will receive a 30-day free trial, and the first 200 of you who sign up with my link will also receive 20% off their annual subscription. It's a great deal, and there's nothing better than using your time to do something both productive and fun. So why settle for just being smart when you could be brilliant? The term transgender and all the nuance that we currently associate with it is a relatively modern one emerging as recently as the 1950s. The fundamental concept, however, of a transgender person, which is to say a person whose gender identity is different from their birth sex, is nothing new in history. I can see some of you shuddering through your computer screens. Uh, don't worry, I won't force too much history on you this time. But I think it is still necessary to go through a little history here to develop a contextual understanding of what we are dealing with. Transgender people existed in just about every culture in some capacity, and while there are fascinating and robust histories of trans people in Europe and the Americas and Africa, we will be narrowing our scope specifically to the history of trans people in East Asia. East Asia, you see, has a very long history of transgenderism. You might be familiar, for example, with the long and sordid history of eunuchs in China. 
A eunuch is a castrated male, and they were at times thought of as being not entirely male nor female. In ancient China, like in many patriarchal societies, women were often considered unfit for the duplicitous and thoughtful work of statesmanship. Chinese history, of course, shows us that this is patently untrue. But let's not get sidetracked. A eunuch was seen as having all the benefits of the male mind and capability without a male's ambition for dynasty. Eunuchs were often given positions of great power, and eunuchs were also responsible for some of China's most dramatic historical occurrences, including one such an instance where a weak emperor saw the imperial harem, the women, fighting for political control of the state against the imperial eunuchs. You may also be familiar with how traditional Chinese theater and Japanese kabuki uses male actors to portray female characters. A practice that is not dissimilar to the Western practice of drag or the historical portrayal of female characters by male actors in Shakespearean plays, and might be thought of as trans-adjacent. Japan, in particular, has a curious relationship with transgenderism and gender nonconformity. Portrayals of transgender or at least gender nonconforming characters in media are commonplace to the point of being generally unremarkable because of Japan's long engagement with characters of male sex presenting as female gendered. Now, oddly enough, as far as video games are concerned, the arguable first two significant trans portrayals were both quirks of localization. Consider first everyone's favorite pink, egg spitting, bow wearing dinosaur, Birdo. The English manual for Super Mario Bros. 2 mentions that Birdo thinks he is a girl, and that he'd rather be called Birdetta. In Japan, however, the game we know of as Super Mario Bros. 2 is Yume Kojo Doki Doki Paniku. In that game, Birdo is known as Kyasarin, Catherine, and she is portrayed in that game as a cis female. She ended up with a male pronoun in the Super Mario Bros. 2 manual because her character was mistakenly switched during localization with the male presenting character, Ostro. The manual localizers rolled with it and thus Birdo became trans. And that fateful decision by the manual localization team has caused trouble for Nintendo ever since. The male pronoun, Taibo, was corrected in the Game Boy Advance release of Super Mario Bros. 2, and the Japanese version of Super Smash Bros. Melee calls Birdo Catherine, and in a manner similar to the original manual, states that she prefers to be called Kathy. However, in Smash Bros. Brawl, Birdo's gender is stated as being indeterminate in both versions, and Birdo is described with the rather tone-deaf pronoun it. Birdo is stated to be female in the controversial Japan-only Wii game Captain Rainbow, but the European website for Mario Strikers charged to football notes that Birdo is male. Now, some pundits consider Birdo to be a trans icon, but others consider Birdo to be an offensive caricature. Here's the thing about symbols, though. The origins of a symbol do not determine its meaningfulness. Something can become a symbol even if it wasn't intended to be that way. Aside from Birdo, another early trans character who is a product of localization is Poison, a character who made her first appearance in Final Fight, and whose portrayal as a trans character like Birdo is still inconsistent and at times unclear. Poison was designed by Akira Yasuda with the intention of creating, and I quote, a sexy female gang member to Final Fight. However, the Final Fight team was afraid that beating up women in their video game would cause trouble in North America, and so designer Akira Nishitani switched the female enemies in Final Fight from cisgender female to transgender. Poison's designer, Akira Yasuda, has stated that he still views Poison as a cisgender female in Japan, but as a transgender female in North America. Designer Akira Nishitani has stated on Twitter that in his personal view, Poison is a woman. Interpret that how you may. Street Fighter IV producer Yoshinori Ono has allegedly stated that he considers Poison officially post-op transgender in North America and pre-op in Japan. Remember the distinction that exists by law in Japan, though. Pre-op transgender women are not legally allowed to change gender. As such, Ono is telling us that he considers Poison to be legally male. And so, Poison's canonical identity is still a bit muddy, and portrayals of her characters at times can be downright puzzling. 
here's an anecdote that I personally experienced. I played, very briefly, the Street Fighter Duel Gacha game, released originally by Top Joy, Tencent, and Capcom for China. There was an event in that game when I played it which required you to use only female characters to get an achievement. Your team could have Chun-Li, Kami, Sea Viper, Juri, Makoto, Sakura, and Ibuki, but not Poison. She didn't count for the achievement. Frustrating though it is, at the end of the day, not unlike Birdo. Poison as a fictional character with a nebulous background is what we make of her. Death of the author and all that. It doesn't really matter what Akira Nishitani thinks about North American Poison. I think though that Poison's portrayal as a trans woman with all of the foibles involved in that portrayal brings us right back to our discussion at large. Japanese media features trans presenting people quite nonchalantly, despite the stigma against trans people in the society, and in an especially peculiar way considering that portrayals of homosexuality are still relatively taboo by comparison. And a part of that, as we discussed, is Japan's history of gender non-conforming portrayals in traditional media. There is, however, a second part of this puzzle that we must consider, and that is the cultural philosophy of conformity in Japan. And so to discuss that topic, let us talk a little bit more about everyone's favorite trans character, Bridget. East Asian cultures, and this is not just limited to Japan, are traditionally collectivist and communal. There are many historical theories about this, which we won't get into, I, I promised, after all. But it involves rice-based, communal agriculture, early East Asian philosophy, and... No, no, stop. Okay, okay, I'm good. We're good. The more collectivist nature of East Asia, particularly when contrasted against the more individualist natures of the West, means that individual conformity to a status quo of societal behavior is expected and at times enforced. In other words, while we in the West often associate collectivism with progressivism and individualism with conservatism, in East Asia the phenomenon is generally reversed. After all, if one defines progressivism as the advancement of new ideas over tradition and conservatism, little c, as the adherence to tradition over advancement of new ideas, then sticking to a highly conformist, collectivist society in East Asia is more conservative than it is progressive. In East Asia, breaking the status quo and being individualist is non-conforming and progressive. And yes, I understand I'm omitting a lot of nuance here with regards to collectivism and individualism, but I hope the well-versed among you will forgive me for providing only the 101 here. Being gay or a lesbian is highly looked down upon in traditional East Asian society, even absent the philosophical influences of the West which crept into Japan and thereby the rest of Asia post-Meiji Restoration because it is non-conforming. A man and a man together, or a woman and a woman together, breaks the status quo. Some breaking of the status quo and exploration of this nature might even be tolerated when one is younger, but individuals are expected to eschew non-conformance and get with the program as they enter adulthood. Gender transitioning, however, is a behavior of conformity. If one's behaviors and mannerisms and internal identity is the opposite of one's appearance and gender, that might be considered non-conforming to society. By changing one's outside to match one's inside, there is no longer a visible dissonance, and as such, one becomes conforming. As such, even though transgender people are still considered non-traditional, the act of transitioning itself or presenting as transitioned to conform to societal expectations, conforms to traditional values. And that brings us to the fascinating story of Bridget. Bridget is a trans character from the series Guilty Gear, and she, a little like Birdo or Poison, was not quite written as a trans character from the outset. Bridget's in-game story, in a nutshell, is this. Bridget was born the younger of a pair of twin boys in a town where a superstition stated male twins brought misfortune upon a family and the town. The townsfolk were so convinced of this that when any male twins were born, the younger would be taken and put to death or given up for adoption. Bridget's family, however, being wealthy aristocrats, chose to hide the younger twin and raise the younger twin as a daughter instead of a son thereby hiding the child's birth sex from the townsfolk. This younger son is Bridget, 
and from the outset of Bridget's story, you can see the very specific Japanese culture of conformity leaking out from society into media. Bridget follows her parents' directives, understanding that her presenting as female is for her own safety and good. However, she strives to prove to the townsfolk that their superstitions are unfounded. In so doing, she decides to set off to prove her manliness, only to discover in the next game that perhaps it wasn't manliness she was seeking, but belonging. The most recent iteration of Bridget has her settling in and understanding her transgender identity, with Daisuke Ishiwatari, the creator of Guilty Gear, clarifying that Bridget self-identifies as a woman, having faced parts of herself that she has tried to ignore. But consider Bridget's road to self-realization. It was a journey of conforming to societal expectation as much as it was a rebellion against that expectation. This is, in part, the difference between Eastern and Western portrayals of transgender characters in video games. In a Western game, or in fact in Western society in general, the act of changing one's gender to fit in and find belonging is seen as an unwelcome encroachment by certain conservative individualists. Whereas in Eastern society, and this extends even as far as the Muslim world, if one behaves opposite of their gender, it is conforming and thereby welcomed by conservative collectivists for the non-conforming individual to adjust themselves to fit the society around them. Consider, for example, the laws of the Islamic Republic of Iran. In Iran, same-sex relations are illegal. Same-sex activities are punishable by imprisonment or even execution. You can be executed in Iran for being gay. However, you can be trans in Iran. If you get sex reassignment surgery, you are legally allowed to change gender in Iran. In fact, the government even partially subsidizes your gender-affirming surgery. This doesn't make life easy as a trans person in Iran, far from it. But it does show how vast the difference can really be between individualistic societies and collectivist societies when it comes to LGBT acceptance. And to drive this cultural lesson home, we will take a look at one final case study. Let's look at a character that many of us North Americans may not even realize was trans at all. Let's look at Vivian from Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. Mooney, I can hear you say. I played A Thousand Year Door. In fact, it was one of my favorite games. I don't recall any transgender plotline in that game at all. Well, Thousand Year Door is a very curious game, in that the story arc of an important playable character, Vivian, is handled completely differently depending on the version of the game that you played. Thousand Year Door was developed by Intelligent Systems, produced by Shigeru Miyamoto and published by Nintendo. In the original Japanese, Vivian is described as being a boy who looks like a girl or an effeminate boy, something akin to the Japanese idea of otokonoko, a male girl. She is mocked relentlessly by her older sister Beldum, who misgenders her and calls her a crossdresser, much to her chagrin. And part of her story is learning confidence in herself and standing up to her sisters. In the original version of the game, Vivian is not explicitly stated to be transgender and her identity, in a very Japanese manner, is left vague and up to one's own interpretation. This characterization of Vivian extends to the French and Spanish versions as well. However, if you played an English or German version of Thousand Year Door, any reference whatsoever to Vivian's gender nonconformity are completely erased, and her sister's prodding insults are changed from transphobic statements to bullying over Vivian's general appearance. Interestingly enough, if you played the game in the sole remaining version in Italian, Vivian is very openly portrayed as a trans woman, and in the in-game description, it even states that she's proud to have turned into a woman. This concept of an effeminate boy or a boy who looks like a girl is very consistent with Japanese portrayals of gender non-conforming or trans characters, and this is, again, due to societal expectations of conformity. In Japan and much of the East, being a so-called effeminate boy is less disruptive than being transgender, which is less disruptive than being gay. The German and English versions, in the meantime, handle Vivian from the perspective of what a Japanese developer or localizer might see as being a more compelling narrative in individualist societies. 
which is to say, instead of Vivian struggling with identity and belonging, she suffers from an inferiority complex. She isn't seeking to be accepted for who she is, she is seeking to be good enough to merit a placement and a hierarchy. And what does the Italian version teach us? Well, the Italian version teaches us that we cannot just group every Western country into the West and still have a nuanced perspective on cultures. In learning today about Eastern portrayals of trans and gender non-conforming characters and media, let us not forget that catch-all terms like Eastern and Western have their limits. Let us also keep in mind that I am not advocating a collectivist East good, individualist West bad mentality. Denmark is more socially progressive than Italy, which is more socially progressive than the United States, which is more socially progressive than Taiwan, which is more socially progressive than Japan, which is to say simply, it's not that one culture is bad and another is good, it's that cultures, even neighboring ones, are different, and each approaches complicated topics like gender differently. When we understand the reasons why different cultures understand topics like gender in the ways that they do, we can begin to build a more understanding and empathetic world together. If you watched my video on JRPGs, you may remember how I noted that Western critiques of complicated ideas like capitalism tend to lack nuance, especially when compared to Japanese portrayals which tend to be very subtle by comparison. In researching this video, I came across quite a number of criticisms from Western commentators regarding Birdo and Poison and Bridget and Vivian. Some commentators find offense with how game developers waffle over whether or not to include their characters' trans histories in their portrayals. Other commentators are unhappy with how developers seem hesitant to outright state that a character is trans, in the way that Western games have a tendency to do by putting a trans flag in the game where having a character declare their identity aloud. But I hope that after watching this video, you will see where these more muted, subtle, unspoken portrayals of trans characters are coming from. This kind of media, these kinds of characters, are how Japan explores gender identity within its cultural bubble. These kinds of portrayals are seeds that yield fruit. Japan has a very different mentality and culture development than that of the United States or Italy for that matter and it is developing a nuanced understanding of gender in its own way. See Bridget, who has ascended from otokonoko status into full-fledged, out-and-out trans woman. It is natural for a person to use the lens of their own culture to see the rest of the world. After all, for many of us, it is the only lens that we have. And I know that we Americans are quite notorious for this myopic behavior. But I hope that this video has given you a brief look through a different lens and helped you to understand why exactly Japanese portrayals of trans characters are as they are. Japan and really much of East Asia is slowly moving towards a better understanding of itself. And at the end of the day, isn't that what being trans is all about? The rainbow road might be long and perilous, but at the end of it, you can be sure that there is a finish line. I hope that you enjoyed this shorter Pride Month special. Let me know what you think in the comments. Please also sub and check out the Patreon if you like hearing me ramble. I've been your host, Mooney, and thank you for tuning in to Moon Channel.